Hey, everybody. Hello. Hey, Kim. Hey, Mark. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. Scott, I still owe you an email. Um, we, uh, Kim and I were packing and moving over the last couple of days and we've just settled. Um, but you, I, I owe you an email and it's still coming your way. Sounds good. Hey, Mark. Thanks for joining. All right, let me, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce Galad for anybody that doesn't know him, um, whether you're with us here now or watching this recording a bit later. Uh, Galad is a phenomenal colleague and peer of ours here at Cody Nomad. He's been with us for a couple of years now. And um, Galad is a Python machine learning data science educator, enthusiast, uh, course creator, um, and general What's, not, what's the word, not uh, philanthropist. You might be a philanthropist, but uh, somebody who advocates for people learning. That's what I'm looking for there. <laughs> um, advocate? Yeah, how about advocate? Um, I don't know um, what that word is. Python. Advocate. And, uh, data science and machine learning. And so uh, thank you so much, Galad, for uh, being here and for hosting and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. And uh, I guess I'll just open it up for you. What are we going to talk about today? We are going, I just, Elena also just joined. I don't know if you saw oh, right. We yeah. have uh, Elena, Hi, Elena. Saw one of our new Python students. Oh. Hi, nice, thanks for joining. So we're gonna talk about the security of machine learning. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I need you to let me do that actually, Ryan, or Kim, I'm not sure who's running it. There we go. Yep, okay, so I'm gonna share. I'm not going to optimize for video clip. I will show you a video clip later, but we're going to start with the slides. No, not that screen, this screen. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do a little slides. Um, you guys can all see the slides, right? Yes. Your pointer going crazy. Okay, so uh, this, is a, this is actually a set of slides I made from a university uh, research group like, I don't know, oh, why is it moving? Okay, we'll go with something, that's fine. I'll tell you a little bit about me and then I'll tell you about the slides after it moved by itself. Okay, so a little bit about me, just so you guys know, a tiny bit about my background. Um, I have a master's in computer science. I did my specialization in machine learning. I am a technically, uh, my title is funny here at this university, but I'm an assistant researcher or sometimes I just think of myself as a faculty because I don't, I guess researchers often do lots of teaching because I do a lot of teaching here. At this university, I'm at the Vishwavita Pitham. I'm, I'm in Kerala in South India. So it is currently my early morning. I know it's your evening, um, but for me, it's, uh, it's 6.30 a.m. right now. So that's why anybody who ever works with me is always working in the evening or the morning because I'm always in the opposite time zone for most people. Uh, my research areas that I do in the university are machine learning in general. So we've looked at concept drift. This is what my team that I work with, we look at. And I'm not gonna go through what all these things mean, I'm just giving you an overview. Then I also looked at machine learning with security. So how do you do security with machine learning? I mostly looked at phishing as the kind of the problem area that I've studied. That's where like the majority of my work has gone into. Um, but we've done a little bit of Android malware I mean, like a bit, I have a few students who have done it. I've kind of tangentially watched them do it. Um, and then I'm really interested in the security of machine learning. And this is what I'm gonna to try to talk to you about today. And this is adversarial attacks. And I actually, uh, my team is currently, our paper is under review for our own attack, which was called the feature importance guided attack. I'm not gonna even try to explain <laughs> what it is. It's actually really simple. In academics, you just make things really complicated. Um, not a complicated, very specific. I'm not going to try to talk bad about academics ever. It's just very specific. And when it gets very specific, it sounds complicated. Uh, but it's a super easy thing that we did. Okay, so as I go forward in the talk, I want everyone to feel free to ask questions whenever you want. Stop me whenever you want. What I will do is I will promise to answer your question, but I might not answer it right away. I might answer it um, after I try to finish my presentation, depending on how hard I think it is to answer it. Because I think the way we're structuring this is 30 minutes of me kind of teaching you something and then 30 minutes of whatever talking. Is that right, right? Okay. So ask questions, just popcorn, just ask them right away. Uh, don't wait because if it's something I can easily say or I can spend three minutes on, I will. 
and then it'll clear things up for you. But if it's something I think is bigger and more complicated, we'll save it for afterwards. So please just interrupt me whenever you want. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do was just give you an overview of these acronyms. Let me just see if my pen is working. I have this, uh, yeah, of these three acronyms. So AI, machine learning, data science, and deep learning. Uh, these are tossed around just in the media, in the internet, just constantly. And it probably feels interchangeable. You haven't studied the field. And even if you have studied the field, it might be confusing what people are actually talking about when they are mentioning these things. So I'm just going to give a little overview for what how I perceive them. They might be, this, this is, I think, right. But someone could argue with me about it if they wanted to. Okay, so don't take it as like the Wikipedia Bible, but it's pretty accurate in my opinion. But artificial intelligence, which is what we call AI. This is what the media calls AI. This is this is AI, it's just an acronym, right? Then you have machine learning, which is ML. Now, basically machine learning is a pure subset of artificial intelligence. So in the media, they get used interchangeably, but essentially everything that is machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. But there is some stuff out here in the outer ring of artificial intelligence that's not machine learning. Then inside that, you have deep learning. So everything, this is a fact, everything that is deep learning, DL, is part of machine learning. And you may have read some media articles that try to make it sound like it's a new kind of machine learning. Um, it's not. It's not a new kind of machine learning. It is it's just a kind of machine learning. And they've been studying deep learning since the 50s. It just got super popular in 2007 or, yeah, ish, because it got good basically. And this has all the hype, okay? All the hype around artificial intelligence today in the media is from deep learning, basically, in a nutshell, because it's doing so well. It's performing so fantastically well. That's why all the companies are adopting it. That's why everybody wants it. And most of the time when people talk about AI today in the media, they're really most of the time talking about deep learning, but it can be any of these things. So generally speaking, yeah, is that a question? No. Okay. So generally speaking, AI, I would say is in this way. Now, data science, I kind of feel like is just another word for machine learning. I don't really think it's that different. Um, so I define machine learning as whenever computers learn from data. That's my definition of it. Uh, I got that from, I think, I can't remember where. I didn't make it up. Um, but it's really when a machine learns something. And data science, you know, in a large way is the same thing. You're learning from data. So you know, for me, it's kind of the same thing. Now, traditionally data science is a little bit more statistics oriented. So people who get into data science, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they didn't think they were doing machine learning. I have a friend who has a PhD in statistics and I asked him if he does machine learning and he kind of looked at me funny and he was just like, I don't know how to answer that question. I thought statistics was machine learning. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. This was like, this is six years ago when I was uh, not so f comfortable with these terms myself. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. I mean, all machine learning, most machine learning is just applied statistics. There are some differences, right? It's all schools of thought and schools of ac academia and how it progressed in their own siloed worlds, but it's really a lot of overlap. Okay, so data science is more or less machine learning. So which one is my eraser is not working. I used to have an eraser, but stop working for me. So I'll have to live with that for now. Um, okay, so just take that, uh, understand that as we move forward. Just so if, you, if you've been watching this field from the sidelines, now you guys have hopefully a decent idea of what these things mean. What we're gonna talk about is a couple of things. One is, I just wanna point out something you may already know, but maybe you don't know it, that everyone is using machine learning and data science right now. This is just a Google search from like three months ago when I made this. Oh, he's just moving on his own. I don't know why he's doing that. I, I think it's something about this PowerPoint, but I'm not gonna try to fix it right now. Um, okay, you have uh, 15,000 machine learning job openings. You have 16,000 data science job openings, 36,000. These are postings, right? I'm sure there's some redundant ones. I'm sure this is some noise in here, but this is a good plug for taking our data science course because there's a lot of jobs out there. <laughs> so we have a machine learning data science course if you're interested. Um, it's, it's booming. It's a booming field right now. And I often, I think the way I'm starting to think about it, it's sort of like 
I think when databases were first started off in, I don't know when it was historically the seventies or whenever for people first made relational databases, you know, SQL, SQL, it was new. Everyone had to learn how to do it. And in a sense, I think machine learning is going to become a software engineering skill that a lot of people are just going to learn in school and they'll know how to do it a bit. And they know people who specialize in it. And right now we're in this time where everyone is just rushing to learn how to do it. And all the companies want to hire to do it because people think it's going to help their business. Um, the next one, yeah, see, I didn't, that's really okay with that PowerPoint. You're, you're, you're really jamming me up. <laughs> Okay, so now you have the intersection of machine learning and cybersecurity. These are all ads. I just Googled this, but these are ads. That means these companies are all paying for those spots. Um, that's another example of how important these, this intersection is. People are actually paying to advertise on this because they think that it's very important and they want to get customers going to them. So these are four different companies offering cybersecurity services with machine learning essentially. And this is just four of them. And I thought that was quite interesting. Now, what do we do with machine learning? Well, we do these, please, please PowerPoint. Sorry, folks. I didn't test it on this computer. I switched computers before I started it. So what do we do with it is uh, intrusion detection, malware detection, phishing detection, threat detection, really just detection. Okay. So when we use machine learning to do cybersecurity, almost all the time we're doing detection. And yeah, we're trying to find out if something's happening. You know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? That's basically what it comes down to. Is someone attacking me right now or not? And you can use machine learning to do that. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's happening. It's happening all over the industry. Now, the reason that what I really want to talk to you about is the security of machine learning. But in order to talk to you about that, I have to try to give you a really brief overview of how machine learning kind of sort of works. And so this is the basic idea of supervised machine learning. Um, are there any questions? Everyone's real quiet. I don't know if anyone had any questions. I'd love to, anyone, nothing? All good, okay. So most machine learning is supervised. What that means is you have these large data sets and then we're looking at some nice pictures and you can see over here, you got mammal. So these are all mammals, right? That's all it says. And then you have placental, then these are all subsets actually. So a husky is a mammal, a husky is a working dog, a husky is a dog, a dog is a canine. And they've created this data set. This is a very famous data set called ImageNet. And I'll give you some, some statistics about it. But the important part to, to point out here is that we have a data set where we have a picture and we know that it's a vehicle and that it's a crowd. Oh, no, this one we know is a Timuran. This is a specific one, right? This is a vehicle, but it's also a timber. It's a trimaran. And each one of these pictures is labeled. This is the important thing. So when we talk about label, what we really mean is there's a file. It's, it's a dog picture, right? But it has attached to it this, this label of working dog so that I know what it is. A human has labeled what it is. This is what we call supervised learning. And then we teach the machine to know what it is, but it can't just look at a bunch of dogs and just be like, those are dogs it won't work. You have to say, here's a bunch of dogs. These things are called dogs. Now learn what a dog is. All of these are dogs. Then it can say, yeah, those are dogs. But if you just show it pictures with no labels, with no words attached to it, then it has no way of knowing what they are. And that's, that's true for humans, right? If you just show us dogs and don't tell us that it's called a dog, we won't know that it's a dog, but we would know how to recognize it again and again, where a computer, it's more questionable. Okay. So this is how it works you build a model, which is really just a math function that predicts the task. And predicts means it's the, yeah, predicts, what is it? Okay, so you have something, you stick it in your machine learning model, your friend, and he says, it's a tiger. Okay, that's the idea. That's what we want. And, and if you look at your phone, uh, you can do this with your phone, with Google Translate, Google uh, Lens, where it can look at, it can, you can use optical character recognition on your phone. You can take your phone, you can point it at some text in another country in a different language, and it'll automatically translate it for you. That's all machine learning. Google Translate is all machine learning. Ad placement is machine learning. It's everywhere. Now, another way of looking at, this is like a nice, cute way of looking at it. A more true way of looking at it is it looks something like this. You take the picture, because you're actually not sticking in a question mark, right? You're sticking in the actual picture. This is a real picture of a tiger. 
but we don't have a label attached to it. When we want the model to predict it, we don't tell it what it is. We're asking it to tell us. So then the model actually <laughs> looks like this, okay? This is your function. This is just a matrix. But this is a function just like everybody knows y equals mx plus c. Well, it sorry, I got an extra x there. It depends what country you live in. It's a different thing, but you've all seen something like y equals uh, in school, right? You've seen y equals 2x plus 5. Okay, this is just a function that you learned in school. This is also just a function. It's not any different. It's really not any different. The only difference is you've got this x here is uh, given to you is what we play with. This two here, this two is the a, okay? That's what's the m. m here is a here, okay? So what we're learning in this function, what the function learns is these m's. It's called the coefficients. I'm not gonna say more than that. But just know these are called matrix. All these A's, we can just say this A's are equal to the parameters. Okay, so when they talk about how many parameters a machine learning model has, they're talking about how many M's, how many different things were learned. When you learn a machine learning model, you're really learning just a function, not just one matrix, but you can think of it like that. Now, what it does is you stick in a picture of pixels. It does math. It's a matrix multiplication or whatever. And it tells you something like this. Probability that it's a tiger is 0.89. Probability that it's a small cat is 0.11. Okay, that's what actually is really happening. And then what we say is, hey, it's pretty sure it's a tiger, it's a tiger. Okay, that's how we do these models. Now, the most, the state of the art is ImageNet. I showed you guys that. That has 14 million images with 20,000 classes. Classes is different kinds of labels, like dogs versus cats versus all those things you saw, okay? And it's, it's super, super good. The, the latest accuracy is, um, actually it's, it is worth showing this. Let's see, if I go out of presentation mode. I have it. I have it open already. And computer is not cooperating. Maybe it's because I'm sharing it's different. Uh, let me try that. Let's see a browser pop up for a second. Yeah. Um, let me move this thing out of the way. Stop sharing. Okay, yeah. This is the image here. Can you guys see the browser now? Yes. Okay. So this is actually super interesting if you want to track the history of deep learning. So ImageNet, which is this 14 million thing classifier, I mean, 14 million data set, they've been hosting these large scale image classification task, which basically means super huge image net and who can do the best on classifying all the images in it. And it's a, it's a computer vision contest and it's been going on for years. In uh, 2011, the best accuracy was 50%, okay? Not very good. Now, today in 2021, the best accuracy is 90%. So obviously a lot better. The big breakthrough happened here in 2013 with AlexNet. It went from 50 to 63 in like one, uh, there's some years missing, right? But this is when deep learning took off actually in 2013 with, oh, I thought it was earlier than that, but yeah, this is when, is that any track of my mind? Yeah, it must've been that, okay, yeah. So in 2013, it's when it took off. And so here you're seeing the rise of deep learning, all this upgrades, this is people getting way better and better and better and better at doing this. Now, there's a whole reason why this happened at this time. Like I said, this is not new. It's not a brand new thing. It's just like a confluence of things came together to make it work really well. And currently this year, uh, 2021, the absolute best is this meta pseudo labels. I have no idea what this is. Their top one accuracy, I'll explain what this means in a second, is 90% and their top five accuracy is 98%. And their a number of parameters, okay, that's I did y equals mx plus c, you know, y equals 2x plus 5. y equals 2x plus 5 has two parameters. They have 480 million parameters in their thing. And that's not the biggest one. There's much bigger ones. I mean, down here you see 527, here's 632. But recently, the, uh, it gets the long story. There's a lot of interesting thing about the number of parameters. These are enormous models. You can't run them on your computer. This is where you need cloud computing with lots of GPUs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, uh, it's gigantic models, they're enormous, and they're learning to classify all these things. Now, 
actually, I'm not going to. So, okay, I'll tell you what the top five accuracy thing is. So, let's go back to the slides. So, I showed you in the previous. Get my pen to come back to me. It is not coming back to me. Huh. I have to fix that. I'm going to annotate. Maybe I'll just do it like this. Okay, well, I'll keep going like this. You guys can see that annotation. Now I'm using the PowerPoint annotation. I mean, the, the uh, Zoom annotation. That's working also, right? <laughs> it just switched from PowerPoint to Zoom. Okay, so when it, when it predicts something, it predicts a probability for every class that it knows. So I said it was 0.89 uh, tiger, right? And it was 0.11 cat. So actually for ImageNet, it does this all the way down to like, you know, um, 1000 classes because that's how many they predict on. There's more than 1000, there's 20,000, but on the, on the competition, they only predict on 1000 classes. So when it says top five, it means that the correct answer was in the top five of this 1000. So it actually made a, a thousand predictions every single time. And the correct answer was in its top five and it's in its top five highest probability. That's 98% accuracy and 90% accuracy was in the top one. So it's just a different way of benchmarking it. Okay, so here's the, the, the story I want you to get. Um, I'm gonna have to clear this because it'll, it'll follow my slides. Okay, the story I want you to get is we have really powerful machine learning. It works really well, okay? And now I wanna move slides and it's not moving. So now I really have to fix it. Let's try. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and start. Oh, that's why. Okay. Discard. Share. Okay. Zoom. Uh, oh, there's a question from Scott. Uh, question is. You guys aren't seeing my screen yet, right? I can just look at you. The question is, in the case where the more parameters it has, the better. Uh, no, it's really complicated. Um, obviously, yes, because models are only getting more parameters. So in one sense, like, yes, bigger is better. But on the other sense, no, not really, because computationally infeasible, it introduces all kinds of problems, which I'm going to show you next. So let's try to show you that again. Um, it's a really messy, a really messy question of the really messy answer, Scott. I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I'll try to answer that a little more afterwards. Sometimes I'm not, uh, I don't have a great answer for that is the best answer. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone has a great answer for that. Okay, so here's, here's where we are back in here. So image, so the problem is this stuff works really well but it also is really easily fooled. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So here is an adversarial attack on machine learning. And basically you have this panda, everybody can see the panda, right? Looks like a panda. And our ImageNet classifier said with 57% confidence, this thing is a panda. Now, 57% confidence may seem low to you, but remember this is out of 1000 classes. Okay, so if you have to ask out of a thousand things and it has to assign a probability to all of them, that's the way it works. It doesn't get a choice. I mean, it can assign close to zero, but uh, it does design to all of them. 57% is pretty good, actually. It's pretty high. So it's pretty sure that it's a panda. Now, what we do is, you can ignore all the fancy math, but what we do is we add this noise filter, okay? It looks like noise. And you actually, what we're doing is this plus sign means I'm taking this picture, which is just a bunch of pixels, right? If you, if you zoom in on a picture, I'm just going to zoom in on the panda. I'm going to pretend I'm zooming in on just this square of the panda. That's this guy over here. It's just a bunch of numbers, right? Like, I don't know how many pixels there would be in that corner, but it's like, you know, 2, 10, you know, 1, 5, 5. It's just some numbers. And these numbers represent the pixel intensity of this panda. And there's, there's three layers because it's RGB and stuff like that. But it's just numbers, okay? It's just numbers. The panda itself in a computer is just numbers. And this thing is also just numbers. This is also a matrix. So actually, they're just two matrix matrices. There's um, you have the you have this guy is just a bunch of numbers, and this guy is just a bunch of numbers. So both of these are are just numbers. Okay, just think of them as numbers. 
And what we do is we're modifying the panda by adding to it these numbers. So it's like a pancake. You have one panda, and then you're putting on top of it another one. It goes on top. It's like a stack, right? So what that means is that this pixel in this corner gets added to this pixel in this corner. Of course, it's a lot of pixels, right? But you get the idea, right? Now, the resulting image is this thing over here. What's it look like? It's a panda. But what's the computer think it is? It's a given. A given is, I don't know what a given is. A given is something else. The problem is the computer is primate. positive. Huh? It's a primate? OK. Really long arms. They're cute. With really long arms, yeah. So this is not a given. This is a panda. But the computer is just convinced that it's a given. But to us, it's a panda. So something didn't work out here. Okay, we just added this thing. Now, how do we make this thing? It's a big question. Uh, this is not random noise. You can't just generate random noise and this will work. Uh, people tested that, trust me. They, they tested, they added random noise. No, add, random noise doesn't change a machine learning model's prediction. This is an attack, okay? This is somebody very carefully figured out every pixel that needed to be added in order to add it to this panda and it made it into a gibbet. Now, if just one person had to reverse engineer it and just like carefully figure out each pixel to make this work, you'd be like, yeah, okay, that's a lot of work to make a panda into a gibbon, right? But the problem is, is that this is super easy to do and you can automate it. You can do it, you know, with, with you know, it's all, there's libraries for this now. It's not hard and you can do it for anything. Uh, so I'm gonna give you some more examples. Oh, this was done in this paper of explaining and harnessing adversarial examples. The paper has 7,600 citations. For those of you not in the academic world, that's enormous. That's a lot of people citing it. And it's only six or seven years old. So a lot of people are studying this, but it's not solved yet. Okay, here's another really fun one. This is an adversarial patch. And I actually have a YouTube video to show you on this. So here uh, you have a, it's a banana. That's what it's saying here. It's pretty sure it's a banana, right? This is 100% probability. It might think it's a slug, which, yeah, that makes sense, right? It could be a banana slug, right? We can see that. Once they stick this sticker on the table, the computer is 100% sure this is a toaster. That's not what we want, right? This is totally wrong. Now, uh, it's not, uh, let, me, let me show you the, the YouTubes real quick. So there's no sound for these, so no, not him. Okay, here's another good one, yeah. So these guys are gonna demonstrate, uh, they're using a video. Uh, you guys can see the YouTube playing, right? Yeah, okay. It's a video model where what it does, it's called YOLO, or you only look once, not you only live once, you only look once. And it's it's super popular model. It's used everywhere in machine learning today and um, in products today, I would say. And what it does is it's pretty clear, right? It identifies people. It's, it's can see this chair. It's definitely seeing him as a person, but it's missing this fellow. Why can't it tell who he is? Because of this patch. He's wearing this patch, this adversarial attack. He printed it out on paper. Once he turns it over, now it can tell he's a person. So this is what we call an evasion attack. He's using the patch to evade the model, okay? And as long as he's holding it, is enough in his range, he, it's completely um, confused. The, the machine learning model just cannot tell who he is. So right. now when he passes the patch over, you're gonna see the other guy now not become a person, right? <laughs> and this bounding box is also being predicted by the model. So it's, it's super cool, one, how well computer vision works. And it's also super scary how computer vision is fooled. So there's a lot of, um, worry about this uh there's if you google around for this you'll see lots of ones about stop signs you see if the next one that comes here is andrew ing talking about stop signs people immediately were like stop signs self-driving cars you can do it to a stop sign and the car will think that it's a go sign and people will die yeah that's completely true it could happen but i mean the problem for me is this goes way beyond computer vision so this is not limited to computer vision these attacks are actually uh let's go back to the slides the attacks are not at all limited to computer vision. You can fool malware detectors. So uh, computer vision is the easiest to do for a lot of technical reasons. And so it has by far the most amount of publications, but it's not any harder to do this on a malware detector than it is to do it on a computer vision model. And I and in my recent paper, we're doing it on phishing and we developed our own new attack to do it. And it takes 
just generally speaking, it takes model accuracy from what looks like 95% down to like 5%. You know, it just destroys it. It just destroys the model's productivity. Um, you can do it on voice commands. People did it on Alexa. They, they actually created these uh, like imperceptible noise that you would just hear as like something like that, like background noise. And then you say, Alexa, you know, make my coffee. And then Alexa's like driving you to the morgue or whatever attack you, you told it to do, right? So you can just, they've, they've designed these imperceptible noises you can add to a voice command and it'll completely change what Alexa will hear you say. So they've done this at all other places, much less so than vision because it's much harder to work on for technical reasons. It's not as easy to do, but it's absolutely possible. Um, speech to text, same problem. Okay, so the last thing I wanna, uh, what, how am I doing on time? Oh yeah, I'm gonna wrap up. So the last thing I wanna just talk about is how hard is it to do? So um, I just wanna say there's the assets of machine learning. What do you need to make a machine learning model? You need these three things more or less. This is, this is the algorithm that you choose to use. Um, and you need the, the data, this is the data, right? And then you need, the, I'm not gonna talk about what that is, but you need to extract features. You can do it without any of these things, okay? You don't need to invade the company to do it. You can do this with a purely black box situation where all I have to do is ask, if I can ask your model questions, if it'll answer questions for me, I can attack it. And that's been proven. Um, and uh, the last thing is there's this paper, I won't go through this, but there's this paper that was recently published where they, um, 20, they interviewed 28 different organizations and 25 of them, these are big organizations, were basically like, I didn't really know this was a problem. And we have no idea how to deal with it. But they're all deploying machine learning models, all of them. So I, I kind of see this as, uh, yeah, this was the, okay, I'm going to stop sharing on the slides because basically I hope I gave you a, an idea. I'll, I'll have a lot of links. Uh, I have a lot of links that I can share. There are some libraries where they're already working on this. Um, so there, this is the library for secure machine learning and their goal is to secure machine learning. And uh, what they're currently doing is you can actually, uh, it's an open source Python library and you can plug it right into the machine learning libraries you already use to attack your own model. So the first thing people are saying in order to secure the models, we need to know how good our models. So if I'm gonna deploy a machine learning model in my company tomorrow, have I done security testing on it? Have I tried attacking it? Do I even know how to do an attack? So that's where you have these kind of libraries that automatically attack it for you. So this is a, a, a very popular one, SecML, and the other one is this uh, adversarial robust toolbox. This is from IBM, I believe. Um, and there's a few different ones, but these are these are the two main ones I've seen. This is by IBM. The other one is by a, a, a group out of Italy. Um, but it's very early days, okay? And the, the last thing I wanna say is, um, it is much easier to attack a model. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go to video. It's much easier to attack a model than it is to defend a model. And this is just generally true of security. It's just a lot easier to break something than it is to fix something. This isn't just true for machine learning security. This is true for web security, for all security. It's just a lot easier to, to tear something down than it is to build it. If you just think about building a house, how hard is that? Well, just tearing it down is pretty easy. Or making a garden. You know, you, you're planting your garden and your fruits and your flowers. How, how hard is it to destroy that with a weed whipper? You can do it in like 10 minutes. That's just kind of a universal truth in my opinion. It's just super easy to break something. And it's super hard to defend it. So currently in, the ever, in, in machine learning land, we don't have a good solution for these attacks. Like there are a lot of defenses have been proposed and all of them have been shown to fail like really quickly. Like it's kind of sad. It's like we're just like spitting up defenses and people are just smashing them down super fast. And so that's just kind of the current state. I hope that was sort of interesting. Um, and I think, uh, uh, oh, the patch. Okay, yeah, so there are some questions. So one thing was, uh, what's so special about that particular patch? Yeah, um, this is this patch. So. What's so special about any of these attacks is that they're highly optimized to fool the network. Uh, you're not seeing my, my screen anymore, I forgot. Um, I'll, I'll put links, but the basic thing is, it's just the same way, you have to understand how a machine learning model is built. What it's built to do is it solves an optimization function. You give it all that data and it's optimized to, to kind of sort it. It's like a sorting algorithm almost. It's like you, a tiger, you, a cat, you, house. 
But how, it, how does it do it? It does it with math. So basically you can reverse the math and you can, you can create these things that mathematically look just like a cat, but physically don't look like a cat. And then you can, you can stick it on there. I, I don't have a good answer other than they solved some good math. They, it's all framed in optimization problems. So you, you set up an algorithm that solves the optimization problem. It produced that patch. They didn't like hand draw a patch and try. No way. It's not like trial and error. They absolutely have uh, math algorithms that they program and that produces the patch. And they told the patch to look like a toaster because they want the machine to think it's a toaster. But they've also shown that you can modify an image by one single pixel. That will fool the classifier completely. They've printed a 3D turtle that looks like a turtle and, it, and the machines all say it's a rifle. Uh, they have a pair of sunglasses you can put on your face that makes the all machine that makes there's a there's very famous machine learning models called celebrity classifiers because because celebrities are well documented so it's easy to get data on celebrity photos because people write about it all the time so there's a, so there's these big celebrity data sets where it can tell you which celebrity is it so they made a pair of glasses that you can put on your face and the rim has the attack and it makes the models think that you're Milo Vovova, Milo, not Milo Kunis, Milo Vovova, I can't remember her name, but it makes every machine learning model think that you're this, that you're this woman, okay? So it just goes on and on. They've done all kinds of cool stuff like this with vision, but it's all about solving these optimization problems to, to fool. Now, the, here's one more crazy thing. If I build a model in my house, you know, my computer, and I don't tell you anything about it, you can build a model to attack like your thing that you know about, and the chances of your attack working on my model, if our models are both doing the same thing, like the same computer, computer vision task, it, it transfers really well. So this is the scary thing is that a model you build for one, uh, attack you build for one model actually kind of works pretty well across a lot of different kinds of models. So it's sort of this universal thing. We, we just really don't understand why it works. And part of the reason we don't really understand why it works is because we don't really understand how deep learning works. So these are mostly attacking deep learning, although my paper is purely attacking not deep learning, but machine learning models at the end of the day are these giant math functions. And, and to peel it back and really know what is it doing, why is it doing, it's not easy. Um, and especially with deep learning with 480 million parameters, I don't know it's why it's doing what it's doing, it's just doing it. And I can, I can, I can benchmark it, I can metric it, I can say it's doing it this well, but I don't really understand the why so well. So when I attack it, I also don't really understand the why so well either. I just know that it works. So then the defenses are even harder to make. So there's a lot of hypotheses and guessing and then failing. That's currently the current state as far as I know. I, I see a, uh, am I muted? Oh, I've, I've been laughing in my head that Jason Bourne needed the, these glasses in the, in the, in the board. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> because I uh, like, you know, it, I, I th this is new to me. I didn't know that these, uh, machine learning attacks uh, were such a thing, right? Because you'd think yep. that uh, somebody wearing a patch on their shirt or something like that isn't gonna completely throw off a machine yep. learning which is looking at the picture as a, as a whole. Um, the, guys, the guys who published that paper actually uh, put the patch in their paper at a large enough size so you could print out the paper, cut the patch out and stick it wherever you want. So you can, you can go evade any image detection if you want with that. I mean, a piece of me, be like you know, because I'm still, even though I'm really into all this stuff, a piece of me is still afraid of all of it too, you know. So it's like I kind yeah, of sure. It'd be a that I think that could be a really good like T-shirt, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> I'm just sorry, a fast T-shirt. Yeah. I was just gonna yeah, say I mean, that man, to print yeah. out T-shirts with that. Yeah. yeah. Where can I buy this shirt? Exactly. I mean, for yeah. the surveillance state, it's great. That's the thing, that's the other side. There's a whole ethics side to machine learning and AI and what's going on there. Uh, that's a whole other talk because there's a lot happening in that space too. There's huge things going on around ethics and AI. Um, that's that, uh, yeah. So for me, it's scary because I'm not trying to detect your name. You know, I'm trying to, our team is trying, well, we originally five years ago or six years ago when we started working on it, we're like, well, let's do, phishing is such a problem people are losing just tons of money and people are getting like swindled. So we wanted to try to do something about it. No, I mean, everyone's been trying to do something about it, but we wanted to research it and learn about it. But now it's like the, the latest, greatest that every security company is using some kind of detection model. They're all foolable. You know, Google's uh, page rank, no, uh, Google's phishing 
classifier, I forget what it's called, but everyone is allowed to use it. It's a safe browsing. It's an API, anyone can call it. Lots of people use it. There's more, there's, these two papers have cracked and broken that thing and, and shown that it's totally breakable. Uh, so it's scary. It's scary that we're implementing a lot of security with machine learning without actually having uh, much awareness that it's also easy to break. So what's um, the, in, in, when it comes to the phishing stuff, you know, which I completely agree is such a problem. There's so many people out there getting swindled every day by these phishing attacks. So in the research that you guys did, what, what kind of, did you come to any, I'm, I'm curious about what, ha what happened there? No, it's, it's just getting scarier and scarier. <laughs> it's not getting, we're not seeing the lightning in the tunnel yet. <laughs> it's a, uh, I mean, I, you know, here's, there's a couple of problems. One is academics. We don't have access to the large scale data sets that you really need to, to handle this. So like in the academic publications, literature, you see all these machine learning models where people are getting 95% accuracy, you know, great performance, but obviously phishing is still a problem. And so I've been watching the, the space for six or seven years now. And I'm like, yeah, wow. One paper after the next is showing with this thing, you're going to get 99%. But, but I mean, why is phishing still like a multi-trillion dollar problem? And recently I, I actually got to talk to, um, uh, a guy who works for Microsoft and he told me he does phishing at Microsoft and he said yeah I mean our accuracy numbers are nowhere close to what people are publishing internally he's like we're nowhere close to that it's, it's a huge problem and it's just way complicated and uh basically it's this whack-a-mole problem it's just I think it comes back to the same thing it's just easier to break something than it is to fix something and it's just easier than to defend something. Because when you have to protect something against attack, you have to protect it against this giant attack surface. You know, like you're trying to, you know, it's like you're trying to build a house that doesn't leak. You know, there's a way you're supposed to do it. You put the roof like this, you put the roof like that. But then nature, you know, it can just send the rain sideways. And now if you've got someone who's trying to put water in your house and your goal, whose, whose goal is to make the water go into your house. I mean, nature is at least not trying to flood our homes. It's just being itself. And sometimes it does flood our homes. But now you've got someone whose actual goal is to flood your home. It's really hard. So I don't have a good answer. I, my answer is I'm more convinced that it's a problem than ever. And I don't, I, I think, you know what I really think? Honestly, the, the solution lies way outside of computer science. The solution lies with people training. Uh, human awareness is the number one thing that's gonna solve these problems. Because at the end of the day, computer security is all about trying to stop you from doing what you wanna do. But you're still trying to do what you wanna do. If I can just try to stop you from doing what you're doing, that would probably be a lot easier than stopping you from doing what you wanna do. Like. If I can convince you not to try to hack me, that would be the best. But even yeah. better than that, that, that would be the best. Then the next level is if I can train my grandmother to somehow, you know, human training is, is gonna be probably more effective than a machine learning model. That, that's my, yeah. my honest take right now. Training people is probably gonna be more effective than training computers. And we never want to do that because that's that's expensive. That takes time. That takes just a ton of time. How do I get people to sit in front of me and listen to me? And uh, how do I able to take it seriously? And, and nobody has time for that because of so, so social reasons, right? So that's why you read about these articles where somebody got a, a raise in an email and then it turns out it was a phishing test and, and people were doing stuff like that to try to train their, train their employees, give them something that they might fall for and then be like, ha, you fell for a phishing email. Now I have to train you. It doesn't really work that way. One thing that I like about this conversation in general uh, and something I'm always um, trying to, you know, communicate to everyone that I work with is it's really, really easy to get distracted and focus on this example that works just the way you want it to. Yes. Right, ninety-five percent accuracy, hundred percent of the time in the top five, right? But what really matters in the realm of software development is how it will break, right? Yes. Um, and the you know, I've people, somebody who watches this video will probably shake their head and laugh at me because they've, they've heard me say this before. But a buddy of mine uh, was asked; he came and spoke at a guest lecture in, in one of our courses once, and somebody asked him the difference between a junior engineer and a senior engineer. And without missing a beat, he said, a junior engineer expects everything to work just the way they designed it. And a senior yeah. engineer expects everything to break. 
right? And yeah. so uh, what I like about this whole conversation and this whole topic is that um, we're, we're also mesmerized by the fact that a computer can figure out that this is a tiger and that's a school bus, right? But the, the, what we should be looking at is how, what are all the ways that this can go wrong, right? And, yep. and, and, and as you say, because it's being built into our, you know, global system built, built into the fabric of our society it's scary right. that's why i showed that uh those those hiring at the beginning i mean everyone is hiring everyone is deploying this stuff everywhere now it's not always a risk like if you're deploying machine learning to find out where a customer might, might click or how to increase your revenue or um you know which are the most likely students that are going to fail you know the course and i want to stop them from failing what kind of attack, I mean, a student could mask themselves as not failing. I mean, what, there's not always a risk involved, right? But in a lot of places, there is a risk involved and a risk that we don't always see as well. And there's a whole other element of bias. Uh, that's the whole ethics side. There's, these algorithms are not unbiased at all. So that's another another huge topic. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, th that's when there is a risk involved, just go to codingnomads.co slash swag and you can get the t-shirt, <laughs> you can get the sunglasses. <laughs> yeah okay oh you guys are gonna get it okay we'll, we'll work on, well, let's, yeah we'll work on that yeah let's do it no, why not let's do it let's i mean it, it would be funny it can't be that hard yeah um uh, yeah i'm sure someone's already selling it i'm sure yeah you just have to make sure you do the one that is makes you anonymous not the one that turns you into a rifle because then you'll get like stopped by the police all the time i want to be mila i want uh, to be, uh what's it I think it was Vovovic or something. I, I'm not sure. Jovanovic? Yeah. Or... Jovanovic. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I do want to say another thing, which was really interesting about this whole thing. That first paper where they did the Panda Gibbon thing, they actually weren't trying to attack the model. That's what's also really interesting. They weren't trying to make an attack. They were actually trying to solve some other problem. They wanted to see what happened when you transformed the image uh, into what the, you know, they had some idea like, okay, it says it's a bus. It says it's an ostrich. What if I try to make it in between a bus and an ostrich? What does it think the in-between of those two things looks like? And they were trying to make the image that they thought the model would find as an in-between. And on the way to doing that, they accidentally found these, these things that just fooled the model completely. And they were kind of like, oops. <laughs> and the, the first paper that came out, it wasn't even the center of the paper. It was a paper called Intriguing properties of neural networks. And it was three different things that they found intriguing. And this was just kind of sandwiched in the middle like that. Yeah, we found this really weird thing. It's super weird. And everyone was like, wait, what? <laughs> and then everybody started to freak out. And like in the last five years, you have like literally 3,000 papers published on this. But this is just papers. Not all of them are, you know, a lot of them are regurgitating stuff. People, it's just, you have to know the academic field to understand. It doesn't, it means people are looking at it, but it also means people think they can publish a paper in it, which means that they think it's something that is, uh, people want to talk about. So the quality of the research is varied, but the, the bottom line is, yeah, it's a big unsolved mystery right now. People are, are, attacks are really easy. That's why I did an attack paper. My last paper, I made a new attack. Super easy. It took us, no, it wasn't very hard. Defending it, we're like, eh, <laughs> that's going to be hard. That's the next one because it's much harder to do it. Sort of like, uh, yeah, it's just the way it is. Nice. Well, anybody, um, Scott or Mark, Arnold, hey, Jared, good to see you. Um, anybody else got any other questions or thoughts or things they'd like to bring, ask a lot? Well, anything, it doesn't have to be about uh, attacking stuff, Just whatever, machine learning, anything. Everybody, are you, is, is, are you doing, oh, we got one from. Uh, yeah, I don't know Snort. Uh, does an ID, so IDS is an intrusion detection system. Uh, so it tries to detect someone attacking in your network. Snort is super popular. Um, it's, I, but I don't know off the top of my head if Snort has machine learning baked into it. But there are many IDS systems that do have machine learning baked into it. Yes, absolutely. Techni typically, most of these systems, including Google's page uh, detector, it's a phishing detector, they have a lot of um, more rule-based systems. like. Because you can tell a lot if just by like some basic logic, like if else statements, really. And they'll use that in addition to machine learning. Uh, so that makes it a little better, actually, because then it's less like the machine learning models are more easily broken than like if else. That's the truth. Like simple logic is harder to break. You know, if if a thousand people are sending the same spam message to me, then it's probably spam. You know, I don't need a machine learning model to do that. But um, I don't know if Snort 
I don't know if Snowit really does, but your spam filter on your email certainly does. Um, your Gmail spam filter absolutely uses machine learning and they're constantly calibrated and people have been, but people have been attacking that for years. There's even a different kind of attack where they'll, they'll send a bunch of spam that looks a certain way to clog up the spam filter because the spam filter is constantly being trained. Their spam filter is not like a thing they deploy today and then, you know, next month they change it. It's being retrained like every hour, I would guess. It's constantly being updated by all the spam Google's getting. And, and people will, spammers have done this thing where they'll spam out a campaign that Google catches, but the spam campaign has certain characteristics in it that will kind of actually shift Google's training algorithm. So it's sort of like you're, uh, like if you're playing like, some sport and the team keeps attacking in a certain way. So you get really good at defending that particular way. Then they switch it up to a different attack. So they actually did that where they, they intentionally spammed a certain campaign. Uh, it's a known tactic to clog up the filter to get it to really focus on that kind of campaign. And then they switch over to something else that, that's more likely to get by the spam filter. That's another kind of thing people do. But I don't, I don't know if Snort does particularly. I, I was just, this is, um somewhat relevant but completely different topic the other have you uh have you guys ever heard of that youtube show called smarter every day oh yeah oh yeah i watch him i love him yeah destin uh destin, he's smarter great. Every day. yeah it's a good one yeah yeah uh, he did an episode on and it's just being uh, like uh unexpected attacks on modern technology and it was about how uh there's a guy you know there's it, it was with this guy who has figured out how to um, talk to Alexa or any smart speaker using a laser. Yep. Right? Yeah, I saw that. I watched that. One. Right. Because the, at the end of the day, the noise is just vibrations. And with yep. the laser, they can make the same yep. vibrations. So he was yep. showing how we're using a laser pointer from out somebody's, they, out somebody's house. They and, open the garage door. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so basically the big takeaway there is don't put your Alexa inside of a window <laughs> because at, yeah, I mean, the, the, the big takeaway, if you care about security, like this is people always ask this, like, how do I protect myself? Like the only answer is don't use your computer. <laughs> if you want to be like a hundred percent safe and make sure you never get hacked, don't go online. Don't use your computer. Yeah. Like yeah. that's it. Go, go offline, go on the grid. And I think crazy. Line yeah. Go off and get off. What's that, Ken? Said line your house with foil. Yeah. And the, I don't know if that's real, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I do want to get to Mark had a question. He said, how common is machine learning in smaller businesses? Uh, I, I think it's getting more and more common. I mean, another thing you have to realize is that smaller businesses are using bigger business. Software as a service is rampant. Coding Nomads uses software as a service all over the place. So we're using Zoom right now. We're using machine learning, guaranteed. Guarantee you were using machine learning. So you, when you when you're thinking about safety and security of a of a of a company, you have to not just think what am I using in my company, but but what are the tools I'm using and what are they using. So in that sense, kind of you can't get away from it. But if you're asking specifically, like how often are small businesses building and deploying their own machine learning models? I don't know. I don't I don't have any stats on that or anything. But my my intuition is it's happening more and more because it's actually super low hanging fruit. That's why it's so popular. Everybody has a data set. People, you know, data sets don't have to be 14 million images. It can just be all the customers you sold something to last year. And then you want to do something on that and just very simple regression. That's why that's considered machine learning, but it's also just statistics. And so it's just very simple stuff you can do. So I, I think it's getting used more and more everywhere. I think there's lots of 50, 60 uh, size, 50, 60 people size companies that are hiring data analysts and data scientists to work in small companies. Um, you know, every startup probably has a machine learning person, but they're they're like aiming for a big, not small. Um, I th I think it's only growing in popularity evenly across the field. Uh, but I would probably also say that smaller companies are more likely to use machine learning as a service, which is a new thing. It's coming around absolutely. Um, than they are to hire their own person. Did I would answer your question, Mark. I was going to jump in there too, and that the, because of like AWS ML and uh, mm -hmm. Google Clouds, uh, Google. Uh, I had a talk with a friend who is a, a Google Solutions Architect type, and um, we did a tech talk about it. Actually, it's up on our YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. it's fascinating and really, really exciting. Um, what am I? I'm, is it big, big cloud, big, big something? I'm forgetting it right now. Um, 
but they they're making these incredibly complex uh sophisticated machine learning services and tools basically available to the common person uh, it's basically automated it's sort of like you just tell it i want this and it just does it for you right like amazon has that for text recognition you can just kind of tell it what you want it to make and it just makes it for you more or less right and so a lot of smaller companies like at Cody Nomads, we're not, you know, internally using any of that kind of stuff, but it's very, there's, I would say there's a lot of small companies, like you, you're probably going to find a bunch of, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 person companies that are trying to do some really deep tech stuff, right? Where they're, they're pushing the limits and they're, they're kind of super, super deep tech stuff. And they're definitely uh, using all of, all of those consumer based, um, you know, ML as a service kind of. And that's the, the consumer based stuff. The open source stuff is really easy to do. You can watch a YouTube tutorial for like an hour and you can have your own working image recognition software on anything you want. It's super easy to do. It's not like you need to be at Google to do that. You, you can run it on your laptop uh, because while it takes a long time to train these models, once it's done, they're very portable. Uh, you can download it, you know, it's a hundred megabytes and you could run it. So it's it's very easy to do it open source on your own computer to get pretty cool stuff done really fast. Uh, and that, but that all that, <laughs> the open source part is a little more scary. I, I love open source, but when everyone's using the same model, it makes that, if you're looking from a security perspective, it makes it more vulnerable. Yes and no, right? On one hand, uh, no, because everyone's looking at the code, but yes, because everyone's using the same data set. So if everyone's using the same data set, you have a much higher chance that my attack will work on your model, basically. But I don't know. I'm not going to say, I don't, I don't want to say it that strongly, but yeah, you can do it easily everywhere. And I'm not trying to say you shouldn't use machine learning, by the way. I, I love machine learning. I think it's awesome. <laughs> I don't want anyone to be scared of this and think, oh, we shouldn't use it. I'm just, it's super interesting security side that, uh, we should be aware of, you know, we should be aware of it and you should just ask what are the risks involved with doing this? And there's tons of applications that are no risk, but then there's certain applications where there's a high risk and you should just be aware of that risk and be able to ask yourself and your company or whatever you're doing, even in your personal life, do I think this is a risk to my company? Do I think someone will try to do this? And oftentimes the answer is no, I don't think so. And then you can just use it fine. But then if it is something that you think, is this somewhere where someone would do this and it could cause my company a big reputation harm, this is all risk assessment. This is, this is done in companies. Then you need to be aware of it. And that was what was scary about the Microsoft papers. They interviewed 25 companies and the people who were consuming these models had no idea that they were even attacks. They literally said, I thought you guys were dealing with that. Like, you know, we're getting it from you. I thought you're hardening it. Why aren't you doing that? They, it's like the awareness wasn't even there. So that's really scary for me as a security person that these large companies are, are adopting it, large and small, and they don't even know that there's a problem or there could be a problem. So um, Mark and Scott, Carlos, Jared, Ar Arnold, which, if you don't mind my asking, which of you, is interested and or planning on going into the data science and machine learning route? I am for sure, yeah. Nice. I mean, so this is, I, this is really, uh, and Arnold, nice. You know, I, Arnold, Arnold finished our course. He just, he just finished uh, two weeks ago. He's still okay. going, he's, yeah. still with, he's still working with us, but he's, yeah. he did go through it. Our I, great A student. Nice, great work, Arnold. Um, I, I appreciate you, Galad, you know, talking about this and bringing this up because uh, as we're learning this stuff and getting started, knowing from the very get-go that um, there's, you know, pit, pit, pitfalls and uh, holes in the strategy and in the philosophy and that uh, it's not the holy grail, right? And that it's still this young kind of fragile kind of... Um, doesn't know what it doesn't know kind of industry, right? I think it kind of reframes the the conversation a little bit, especially as you're learning about it, right? Because you can you can learn these concepts without thinking about them as the holy grail or the yeah. uh, you know yeah. the, the Bible or whatever on all yeah. this stuff, and that it's such an yeah. evolving topic. Yeah. 
machine learning is a scary field because a lot of people, if you just read the media, AI is just going to fix everything. You know, Facebook is going to fix all their problems with AI. And I'm just like, come on, guys. Like, they have the top researchers. They can't, they can't believe that. Like, and they got to know, like, are they just deluding themselves? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anyone works for Facebook or loves Facebook. I, I, I have some personal problems with Facebook, <laughs> but I, I, I'm not saying that Facebook is bad, but I do think that some of their approaches are a little naive and, and, uh, this is, this is a, yeah, so anyways, it's not a magic wand. That's a, that's a challenge all of all machine learning engineers, uh, data scientists are facing right now is trying to explain to their uh, companies, this isn't gonna just fix all your problems. That's a big, it's a big right. hurdle. And it's not just about uh, security. I mean, it's just like they want like, well, you'll just use machine learning, that'll do it. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not that easy or it's like, it's more complicated than you think. It's like, it's not, I can't just wave a wand and that problem will go away. People people do kind of think about it that way because it's artificial intelligence and that's like magic, but it's not magic. It's yeah. just fancy math. Well, as a, as a small business owner, you're always wanting whoever you're talking to to be able to solve all your problems, so. Yes. I, I think it's not just a small business owner, Brian. I think all business owners <laughs> want that. Well, great stuff, Galad. This has been um, a super enjoyable and enlightening conversation, and um, and it's really piqued my curiosity. Like the the those the, those two guys in that video, one of them holding that little picture. The fact that that little you know that yeah. Is, it's fascinating. So um, thank you for bringing this to our attention and sharing with us and taking your time and and uh, taking all of our So time. I can post some links, like some resources, like how to get started learning about it and some good YouTube uh, explanations and, and some just more fun attacks to watch. Well, where should I post this, Ryan? Um, we'll make a post in the forum uh, that has a link to this recording. And um, and that would be- the We can put the links in the, in the YouTube description also, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Carlos and um, Carlos had another question. Uh, yeah, Carlos. The uh, so TensorFlow and PyTorch are for deep learning, and those are the like the yeah, those are the de facto ones everyone uses. Um, but if you want to get started with machine learning, more classical machine learning, I recommend Scikit-Learn. Uh, I, I, the way we teach our data science courses, we teach the basics of machine learning first, and then we're, we're starting our deep learning course now, right? Right. We're bringing that out uh, in the near future. Yeah. But uh, we don't teach deep learning techniques in our data science machine learning course. That's because it's a subset of machine learning. So we want to teach the actual machine learning pipeline, like how do you do an experiment end to end? And you can do that without even touching deep learning. Um, so that's scikit-learn, it's called sklearn is the package name. Uh, and, but TensorFlow and PyTorch are for the absolutely like go-to uh, deep learning libraries. They're used everywhere. I mean, they're the only two that are being used anymore. Nice. Well, great. Um, thank you, Galad, again. Thank you everybody for joining. Is there any other uh, questions or comments before we uh, break and let Galad go have breakfast? Yeah, breakfast for me. Good evening for you guys. Great. All right. Well, again, thank you. Thank you all. It's You're welcome. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you for bye joining. Bye, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. We'll post a video of, uh, 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 up on the forum for this and we can have a bit of a discussion and we can post the links on there. And so Galat, yeah. go ahead and just send yeah. me anything that you want to be added to the YouTube and the yeah. forum post and we'll take it from there. And Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you so much. This is great. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.